flatmate of mine knew Mark Ellis. I, I met Mark a few times, but didn't know him that well at this point. We had mutual friends at university. And he came around to our flat to try and get him to go on the show as a fake guest, a fictitious guest, because guests were always falling out and Mark would go, I'll go get someone and a mate of mine. And um, he didn't want to do it. So he said, look, go down the bedroom there, talk to Lee, he'll probably, he's stupid enough, he'll probably do it. So I, I wasn't keen, but half an hour later, I'm driving to Sky Studios with a Tupperware container full of garden snails. And um, the, the premise was I was a snail trainer heading off to the States to um, take on the US competition. <laughs> so we're the only two in on it, Mark and I. Went on the, on the show and it, it went down pretty well by all accounts. Not that I knew at the time because there's no studio audience or anything. It was, it was fairly uh, cringy at the time. And then the next week they wanted to do a follow-up story like, you know, where am I now or what happened to me and that sort of stuff. And I think about that time, um, the Cannonball character who was on the show, he left. And Rick said to me, look, do you want a weekly slot doing a sports story? Which I thought was great. And about that time, the cameraman who I used then started at Sports Cafe as well. And he's the same guy I use now for most stuff I do. So that was really, really kind of the start of it. I just went and saw the programmers at Sky and said, look, if I could get the money, would you give me the time slot to make this comedy show? I said, yeah, sure. So it was a sort of a, you know, a pretty proactive approach, which I think everyone's having to do nowadays, um, as opposed to applying for funding and that sort of stuff. It just takes too long and it would bore me. So I just said that, and I think I managed to get, I think it was $6,000 from Auto Trader or something for the very first series, and that's what I made the whole series on. Six episodes. Admittedly, I was ripping a lot of stuff out of Sports Cafe that I'd already done and put it in there. But that was the start of it, really. And then TVNZ picked that up and just sort of started applying for funding and that sort of thing. So it's taking that first step is the key. They said it was like an intrepid journey, but you know, as you know, there's always a catch with it. So it turns out, yeah, we shot the airport and we end up going off to Costa Rica. Was it Costa Rica? Puerto Rico? Costa Rica on this health camp. I think we were one of the first episodes. They were trying to get things out of me because um, it was like an American uh, self-help course, this whole thing. So we're obviously they're filming me in a situation with a guy asking, why are you here, Lee? Why are you here? Well, because I'm in a reality show. No, but what's really troubling you? you know, and it, well, nothing. You know, so it's really weird. So they actually got a bit annoyed because I was never really letting anything out. But luckily, April, on the other hand, was just spilling her, spilling her guts. You know, to the point I actually pulled her aside at one point and said, you know, would you say that, you know, at Eden Park with a microphone? No. Well, you're kind of doing worse here at the moment. <laughs> so anyway, but I think the, we kind of offset each other quite well. So it was, it was a lot of fun, actually. I never thought that would ever get funded. And I think by fluke, New Zealand on Air had back then a charter fund, this, a different kind of funding pool. There was some money left over that TVNZ had, and, and it was just sitting on the desk, the proposal, I think, and it got the funding. So was, you know, it wasn't a lot of funding, but it's probably the most funding I've ever had. Um, and we managed to yeah, do six episodes all over the world um, for that little budget. But um, yeah, great experience, small crew, just traveling around. Half the stuff scripted, the rest is sort of happening as we go and just being on for enough to you know, see which is which, I suppose. Um, yeah, it's a great show. I'd love to do a series two, actually. If I could do one series, now it'd be that. Bermuda Triangle episode was really the final one. We always that was quite that was fun too because we didn't really shoot anything because the premise there was we go missing in the first five minutes and <laughs> you know investigating the very thing we're trying to investigate we we go missing and the rest of the episode just becomes like a best of compile of <laughs> like a eulogy to us so that was easy so we just pretty much had a party in Miami. <laughs> My father was in that strong and minor disaster in 1967, you know, he lived. Being able to be part of this program, which, um, and, and it's seen that emotional stuff, because I've never really done an emotional program before, everything's been purely comedy. Um, it, it, that's what it was, I think. And seeing my parents there and, you know, seeing them nervous about talking on camera, but afterwards being really proud of it and really happy and them getting phone calls from people saying that was great and you've told a really good story here and about time and I think they, you know, it was, it was good. Because, you know, with the normal stuff you're doing, it's all, oh, shit, that was funny or great stuff and 
and, and that, you know, it's great to hear all that, but occasionally it's nice to be part of a program that maybe, you know, does touch people in a different way emotionally, you know. I think it's the perfect show for funding, really, because although it's comedy, you know, these shows pretty much survive on infomercials and that sort of stuff, so there's no reason that real infomercials and that stuff can't get in it, if you know what I mean. Uh, you know, to actually sort of fund it. So I think that's where it's going now. It's, it's you know, I think over the next few months we're, we're making a few more episodes that should start to um, probably, you know, fund itself <laughs> in war, hopefully. But it's a lot of fun. And again, going back to the interview, it's an interview-based show, really, and how much those people know on the couch about what's going on is on a sort of a need-to-know basis, really. Um, some are actors pretending to be a volcano expert, um, but they still don't know too much because they're not actors. If you give them too much stuff, they'll look like bad actors. Um, and good actors sometimes are the ones that look the worst on the show. You know what I mean? But if someone's playing themselves, um, sometimes you've got to tell them they think it's a fun show, so they tend to play along too much with it. You've got to say, nah, don't worry about that. Just, you know, look shocked or whatever. So, yeah, it's a, it's a good show. I'm sick of it now, though. <laughs> Most people I've talked to that were on it really, really enjoyed it, you know. I think we were probably all expecting that to be a little more self-indulgent about us, you know, learning something like, uh, you know, who do you think you are sort of show, um, where you're going to actually meet relatives that are, you know, but it turns out they're relatives, but uh, they're not as, you know, they could be anyone really, you know. Or you could sleep with them. I'd say, you know, <laughs> not that I did. I'm just saying that, you know, you could have, um, not, you couldn't have, but it's, yeah. But once you get past the self-indulgent part, that, oh, yeah, it's not really about me. It's a device to get someone traveling around the world to show how diverse, you know, where our genes come from in general. Yeah, it was great. Problem is now I've already been done. I can't go again. It's amazing how many people actually ask, you know, are they green screen? You know, these, these ads, and that, no, it's actually be cheaper to probably go there than to make it look that real. Um, so, yeah, that's great. It's a great experience, and it's a very small team. There's a, tiny, a small agency in Christchurch, and the Hellers team in Christchurch as well, which I deal directly with now. The, the Hellers kind of the team. It's a family business that's kind of got bigger. So, and that's expanded now, so I pretty much do all their online stuff, and up till now, I was just the face in the commercials, but now my production company is actually making the ads as well, which is great. So you've got more control of the pace and you know, and the editing, which is good. So we just recently did a, another batch in, where did we do it? Holland and uh, Barcelona, Rome and Morocco. It's a uh, yeah, great relationship and hopefully it lasts. <laughs> It's more distinctive than it used to be. Uh, I think it always used to be sort of low, and I think people had a weird accent. People were used to it. It, it certainly stood out. But lately, I've been having these throat issues. Um, you know, I've had a couple of operations, and it, it's, it's all comes down to a tension thing, apparently, in the you know the larynx. And funny enough, and people think it's always been like this. I think it's like maybe slowly your hair slowly receding or something. People always just picture you always looked a certain way. They don't ever picture me with hair, which I did have. But yeah, it's just one of those things now and I think I've just got to get on with it and, you know, and not worry about it too much. But it, you know, it has affected performances, mainly on the confidence side of things. Like often, especially in a situation with three or four people, you're about to say something, you know, you think it might be funny or something, you know what state your voice is in that day and you're more worried about how it sounds than what you're saying. And then you start going, well, it's probably not worth saying anyway. You second guess yourself. And once you start doing that, it's a bit of worry. But overall, it's, um, it's not too bad. <laughs> Pretty bad right now, but it's, you know, it's been worse.